Hi. Right when I started recording, I've got this very curious doggy right here. See? I think she thought I was like talking to someone. Who's that? Look, say hi to everybody. <laughs> see, my name's Alice. I'm spoiled. Now she's shy. Now she's like, what are you doing? Am I gonna get in trouble for this? No. Okay. Oh wait. Now the other one's being jealous. Okay. <laughs> You're so awful. Say hi. Oh, then you need a bath. They're gonna get baths this weekend. Who's that? Oh, you're photogenic, huh? Right there. You see you? That's you. Say hi. Okay. I love you. Go lay down. They're always very curious. Okay. So that's a fun way to start out this lecture. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay. So this is the lecture on genetic. Yes. Can I help you? Now she's like, give me more time. Um, genetics and inheritance. Um, so when I opened this PowerPoint, I was like, oh, there's a lot of, this is kind of an intense PowerPoint, right? Um, we're going to get through it. Um, it's probably one of the more heavier ones for the semester. I'll say everything that's at the beginning, but, uh, you know, we'll get through it. Okay, so slide two, cell types. Um, so two, two main cell types. Now, if, you, if you've taken like an intro to bio, the intro to bio, biology some of the stuff i'm going to talk about throughout this powerpoint you're gonna be like wow she really oversimplified it and that's accurate that's and that's fine this is not an intro to bio this is biological anthropology and i need you guys to make i need to make sure we are all on a similar page about some of these the basics of biology as we start talking about the evolutionary process like the physical evolutionary process um but i do simplify a lot of it like just so you, just so i know that you guys have a very general understanding um, that's all that you really need for this class. Now, if you were gonna start, if you really wanted to focus on biological anthropology, you might then have to take more bio or like anatomy courses. Um, but for this course, you just need some a basic overview. So some of this, if you've taken like an intro to bio or you took more bio courses like in, in high school or something, then um, some of this will be reviewed for you and that's totally fine. Um, okay, so somatic versus gamete. Basically, the, there are two main cell types in your body. There's like your regular body cells or somatic cells, so like the cells that make up the tissue, like, you know, skin cells or liver cells or bone cells. Now, all of those obviously can be classified into different categories, but in general, they are part of uh, the body, body cells. These are, all of those are very different from the gametes or the sex cells. So you probably have heard that term before, gametes, and if you see here on the PowerPoint, it says, you know, like, obviously sperm for male, ova for female. So hopefully you were familiar with those terms. And you can see there's a picture. These cells are specifically related to reproduction. Um, slide three. Okay, so I wanna preface the rest of this PowerPoint with, because you might be thinking as we're going through this, why are we getting this basic you know, lecture on how reproduction works? Because you assume like everyone knows that. And it is important to understand that that is not accurate and this is just a good example of this so here we can see these these are from the last couple of years um that a lot of adults who you who you think would have not even like an intricate biological understanding of reproduction but like a very general like understanding of how reproduction works but people do not so you can read these and you could see like why i was like you know it's funny because we can laugh at it and be like, oh man, these people. But it also probably speaks to the sex education system in this country and other countries as well. And it's probably not, that's completely accurate that that's, it's not the best for sure. Um, I mean, that's a whole other, that's a whole other, uh, you know, topic about that. Um, but like, but it, it is what it is. And so we can't, I can't as an instructor make an assumption that you guys know some of the basics. And especially when we're considering it, like if we're talking about evolu um, anthropology through the last, you know, like 100 years or 200 years, like these early bi biologists or naturalists, um, why didn't they get like, well, cause they didn't understand the way that reproduction works the way we understand it now. And I bet you in 100 years, they're gonna understand it even more intricately. Um, so like before when I was talking about Darwin, like when Darwin and Wallace presented their ideas, um, because they did not understand reproduction the way we understand it now, that they thought, um, okay, Darwin's idea makes sense, but like, how does this one part work? How does the other part work? No, like, that's not how it works, Darwin. Because they didn't understand at the time, they didn't know the, 
the way we know it now, how reproduction works, even the basics, you know. Um, so I talked about before, like, you know, genetics, you know, oops, male, female, 50-50, there's a little bit more to the process, but like in general, that's accurate. And then you have the individual, like the offspring, um, that even that thing that we are like, of course, everyone knows that not accurate. Not everyone now knows that. And, um, people in the past definitely didn't know that. So here you just have some, so I won't read all of them, but I'll just read you the first one. Cause it's, you know, um, I am a 22 two year old woman married recently to 25 year old husband. Okay. I caught him cheating some months ago with the maid. I'm pregnant now. I want to make sure the baby is mine and not the maid's. Okay. So we can laugh at that. And I mean, it's a little silly, but this, I'm mean, like, I said, this speaks to the sex education system. And it speaks to what I was saying. Like, I can't always assume that we understand, like that you all understand the basics. Now, if you're thinking, I don't understand what's wrong with that. You're in the right class. You're going to learn something. Um, and it's unfortunate that we don't have the opportunity to be like in class to be able to have these in class discussions, but we're going to, we're going to make it work. Okay. So just, just know as we're going through some of this, you're like, why are we going over some basic stuff? This is why. Okay. Slide four chromosomes. So here we have um, some bullet points and a nice visual. And like I said, a lot of this is going to be very like, you know, general overview so if you've taken an intro to bio you're like wow this is like way simplified that's true that's totally fine for the purposes of this class um so located in the nucleus of your cells you have these chromosomes um, which have, of course have all the dna on them and they i don't know you guys can read in that part um so sometimes they can so often you'll hear um so like oh, i wish we were in class because i would say how many chromosomes do humans homo sapiens have and I often will get like two different answers, which are, they're both correct. Like some people might say 46 or 23 pairs. So that, that's the same number. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. That's the same number. That's going to come up again in this PowerPoint. Um, so like at certain parts in the process, um, they are like paired or not paired. But that's fine. So you might see the visual. Sometimes you see them like looking differently. Um, but all you need to know is that, that there are, there are pairs. Humans, we have 23 pairs. Other species will have more or, or fewer. Um, all of the genetic information that about you as an individual is located there. The DNA is located there. Um, that's all you need to know. Slide five. Okay, perfect, perfect segue. So human, the human karyotype. So karyotype is just this, this visual representation of like the, the 23 pairs for humans. So you can see, like you can see how they're, what they look like. Um, the first pair, the second pair, on to like, you know, the 23rd pair. And you can see the structure of those chromosomes are similar in those pairs. That's the point. Like, um, that they are, um, it's the same. Now, there are some slight differences in them, but it's the same. Now, you're looking, you're like, I don't see the number 23. So on this, the 23rd is the sex chromosome. It's not labeled 23. They have it specifically labeled the X and the Y. Um, but it is the 23rd chromosome. And then, of course, if you were in class, I would ask you, is this individual a male or a female? Talk about that in more detail later now why are they called x and y when you could we could have named them r and z or a and b like someone probably was like that kind of looks like an x and the other one kind of looks like a y so that's what we, there's that's really the reason why um so 23 pairs waffle Okay, um, so slide six, genes. Um, so, so, so back to what I was saying about the chromosomes. So here you can see this nice visual. If you're looking at, um, imagine there's a pair of chromosomes. I don't, it doesn't matter, chromosome seven, chromosome eight. This is just a general example. On each pair of chromosomes is the same um, information. Um, let me reword that. On each chromosome, there are sections, portions of the DNA on either, on either of the pair that code for the same thing in that it might be this section codes for hair color, this section codes for nose shape. Now, of course, genetics are way more complex than that, but this is just a general example. This section might code for fingernail texture, whatever it is. If you're looking at the pair of chromosomes, 
that section, uh, that gene, is gonna code for the same information, the same portion of your anatomy, whatever. But there might be a variation in that. So like, for example, this is the point of the allele. It's an alternative form of the gene. So let's say you have chromosome like seven. And you're like, okay, this top portion of the chromosome, this gene, this section of DNA codes for hair color. Okay, this section on this part of on one of the pairs of chromosomes codes, codes for hair color, and this section as well. Um, but the specific information might be different. It might be blonde hair, brown hair. Could be different, could be the same. Blonde hair, blonde hair. Um, so just know that it could be the same, it could be different, but the portion, the gene, is still coding for that specific trait. Although the specific information could be the same, could be different. And then we're gonna get into in a minute like about what that means in terms of like dominance or like dominant versus recessive. Um, but just know that, so you can see this in the picture, like here it's like the gene coding for eye color, for eye color could be different, blue versus green. The gene for earwax is the same the gene for earlobe shape, so like whether it's attached or unattached, could be different. So sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's different, but it's always gonna be that same portion of DNA, the gene is gonna code for that trait. It's just that the information on either might be the same, might be different, and one might kind of overshadow the other in terms of what you see visually on that individual. Okay, slide seven, sex chromosomes. I kind of already said this, um, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. This 23rd is the sex chromosome, so this is going to determine whether you are a male or a female. Um, and in fact, you know, I don't think I mentioned that in this PowerPoint. Maybe later, there was something I was going to say. I don't want to get on too many tangents, though. Um, but you see here at the bottom, female XX, males XY. Now, of course, you might have heard that there are certain uh, medical conditions where you might have like an extra X. Um, or something like that. Um, this is accurate. Like, this is true for all of nature that there are always going to be outliers to anything and everything. Nothing is ever 100%. But sex is a binary. There's male and female. You will occasionally have something like genetically when something you know um, goes the, the the process is interrupted in some way. You get a result that's not exactly XXXY. But often what you see is that the the genetics um, in terms of like the chromosome, like if you have like an extra X or something like that, um, it doesn't always affect everything else in the body. Sometimes it does. Like um, I think later in this, in this semester, we talk about uh, this a little bit in a little bit more detail. So I don't want to go into many tangents about it, but just know, like I understand that and that's a thing we'll talk about later. Um, but in general, this is obviously accurate X, 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 Y. Okay, slide eight. Cell division, two types, mitosis and meiosis. We will talk about these. Like I said, a very simplified version. Okay, slide nine. Okay, now if we were in class, we would go through, through, we would go through this step by step and I would draw a nice visual on the board, step by step. Now I, ha I have it right here. I have my little board, but I'm not gonna draw this really complex process on my little board. Um, and in fact, like in like two or three slides, there's a picture of what I would draw anyway. And I'm not going to have you explain to me on the exam, for example, the step-by-step -step process of mitosis. Like, I, that's not something for this class. What I do want you to know is that it's a thing. Understand, like, in general, the process. So this is when um, the body cells, like, for general growth and repair, you, the body makes more cells. So, like, say you stub your toe and you break the skin a little bit. You need to make some more skin cells. Maybe you break a bone. Your body needs to make some more bone cells. You're growing, you know, as a child, your body's making more cells for that. So that's the general process. So know that. Um, but also, I have it in bold and underlined, the thing I want you to take away from this. If you remember nothing else about mitosis, this is important. In mitosis, the cell begins diploid and ends diploid. You're like, well, what is diploid? It says it right there. All 46 chromosomes, diploid number. So for humans, it's the total number that's that are located in your somatic cells, the total number of chromosomes that during mitosis, if your body's making a skin, if it's taking a skin cell or making a skin cell, it's gonna create a skin cell that has all of your genetic information. That's just how it works, like the regular cells. Be the process begins with that number of, sorry, I don't like the worst hiccups, begins with the total number that you need for your species and ends with that number. That's it. 
This is in contrast to meiosis. Next slide, slide 10. This is the cell, um, the, the production of cells for sexual reproduction, so gametes. We talked about that at the very beginning, somatic cells versus gametes. So this is the process for creating those gametes. Um, whether you're male or female, it'll be different, obviously. There's a lot of words in this slide. Like I said before, I would draw a nice picture on the board. It, like the next slide's gonna be a visual of what I would have drawn anyway. But also on this slide, look at the very bottom. The most important thing you need to take away from this is it's in bold and underlined. In meiosis, the cell begins diploid, but in haploid, haploid is half the number of chromosomes. So in this process, your body's taking a regular body cell, it's doing a process with it, and then at the end of this process, it's going to, you're gonna get a sex cell, you're gonna get a gamete. But for what I just said, that gamete only has half of the genetic information. This is important. This is the distinction between those two, mitosis and meiosis, at the end result. And if you go to the next slide, you're gonna see, the, like I said before, if you've taken intro to bio, you're like, there's way more complexities to like stage one, two, three, of like each pro, those, it's a very complex process. But in general, this is accurate. Mitosis versus meiosis starts out with a regular body cell. They both start out the same. You know, DNA replicates, basically doubles itself. There's a separation within the cell. Uh, the, uh, the nucleus of all this happening, some stuff, other stuff happens. And you get the separation. So for mitosis, you end up getting two at the end. They both have the diplo diploid number. But for meiosis, it's one extra step, essentially. And they split another time. So you get four, and each of those has the haploid number. And the important question to all of that is why? Why? I'm gonna ask this, and like some of you are thinking, I, it's oh, the answer's so obvious, but sometimes in class, I definitely have to like walk the students through, like think about this. Why do gametes only have half, half of your genetic information? And each gamete might have a different type of half. Like we talked about this with the, with the chromosomes being in pairs, and with the genes and the alleles, that on it might be the same info for like hair color, for example, it might be different. So depending on which gamete, it's gonna have different information, which is of course why when you have children, they don't all look the same. They don't all have the exact same treat from you. They might have something, a variation of that, you know. Why do gametes only have half? Hopefully you're realizing, you understand, it's because they have half, because male and then the female, they both contribute half, 50-50, and then you get the individual, the offspring in the end. Like I said before, this is a very oversimplified version of this, but I just want to make sure that that you guys understand that half and half, 50-50, mitosis and meiosis. So if I asked you, what are the what is the describe mitosis in one sentence, describe meiosis in one sentence, and tell me the main difference between the two? Hopefully, you would be able to tell me. Uh, mitosis is for general growth and repair. Meiosis is for specifically the production of, of sex cells. And then you would talk about the difference between haploid and diploid. That's all I really want you to know. Okay, so slide 12, DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Most of you are probably familiar with this in general. You're probably even familiar with the general structure. So here you can see in the picture, it's, it's that, um, um, they, not, it's not in the double helix, it's you know like opened up so you can kind of see what it looks like. So there's always a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. Um, we call this a nucleotide. I know this is a lot of technical stuff. Don't stress. Like I'm not going to ask you, define nucleotide. Like, um, I just want you to have some general understanding of this. I'm sorry, hold on. Waffle is making a leaky noise. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but it's driving me crazy. Waffle. Um, slide 13, so in DNA, there are rules to how, like when the DNA is being formed and stuff, um, and uh, some of the other processes we'll talk about, processes we'll talk about in a second. Like there are rules to kind of how these, uh, the base, the bases can pair up. So here you can see um, there's adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or we can abbreviate those to A, G, C, T. You can see there are rules, and I even have them A with T, G with C, when we're talking about DNA, this is how it pairs up. Of course, this is when nothing goes wrong, of course, and of course, we know that doesn't happen. Um, there are times when it doesn't um, always go correctly, plenty of times when that happens. And we'll talk about that later in the semester too. Um, slide 14, and then there are two functions to DNA. Obviously, we know that DNA is what 
ha has all our genetic information that tells us like who we are and stuff. Um, but there are also so uh, other kind of processes to the DNA and I have these very briefly, um, extremely briefly. If you take the lab with me, we go into this in a little more detail. This is so uh, simplified for you guys, you're lucky. So one is self-replication. This, and I have it here, this occurs when the cell is about to divide during mitosis and meiosis. So I know it, on those slides for mitosis and meiosis, it was like very wordy. You can read them, um, but just know um, that's, that's not the point of this PowerPoint. Um, but I did, I did outline it very briefly for you. But of course, during this process, when the body's making more cells, it has to replicate or double itself in certain ways, the, the DNA being one, because obviously it's replicating itself, so then it splits, so it has to make more of itself. So DNA has to self-replicate that's part of the process, it does that. And then protein synthesis, how we get proteins. Um, there's a whole process in this with transcription and translation and messenger uh, RNA and tRNA and like that's a whole thing. Um, don't need to worry about that, but just know that there are some other process functions to DNA. Okay, slide 15. Some important terminology. Genotype versus phenotype. So genotype is the genetic information. Um, so it could, I could be representing that with the uh, karyotype. I could be representing that with a, a line of DNA code. I could be representing that um, by talking about, did I say chromosome already? Yeah, chromosome. When we're doing Punnett squares, we could be talking about you know that in terms of like the genotype. But the phenotype is literally just the physical thing you see. So you would say, what's my phenotype? I see blonde hair. My hair's not naturally blonde. You can say, I see phenotype is blonde hair. Um, she's tall. Um, she has, you know, like light to medium toned skin. Um, she has unattached ear. I have really small ears too. Maybe the, maybe the video's not picking it up. I have really tiny ears. I, when I was younger, I don't care now. It doesn't bother me now. When I was younger, I used to get teased for it, but I don't know. It's weird. In fact, I have problems. Total side note. I always have problems with ear. Uh, what are the earbuds because they never fit like they're always um, Too big. They just don't fit. My ears are tiny um, But so phenotype is just is literally just the physical trait the physical trait that you when, when you look at someone you can see that You based on the pheno the geno Oh my god based on the phenotype You don't know what their genetic genetics are because sometimes certain traits are like hidden genetically um, We'll talk about that in a second. I think that's on this PowerPoint but so the pheno phenotype is easy. Phenotype is literally just the physical thing, the thing that's interacting with the environment often. Um, but sometimes you have stuff in your in your genotype, your genetics, that doesn't interact with the environment. Sometimes it does, depending on if you're like a carrier for something. This is a really complex thing, right? But just understand that phenotype is like the physical, the physical thing that you visually can see on someone. It's not something, you know, super scientific in terms of like terminology. You could literally say her phenotype is blonde hair. Her phenotype is brown eyes. It's just the physical trait that you see. Okay, slide 16, Gregor Mendel. So I mentioned him briefly when we were talking about who's who, that with Darwin, you know, um, and the other scientists, they're like, we don't really understand how reproduction works, so we think you're wrong. He was like, I'm pretty sure I'm right. And he almost got it almost completely right, even without what we know now. So Gregor, and it's unfortunate because Gregor Mendel was literally doing his research at the same time. And it wasn't until decades later that someone was like, these two things are naughty girl. Oh, this allergy. She has an appointment in a couple days again. You okay? Okay. What was I saying? It wasn't until decades later that they realized that these two things should go to, like, they were connected. Um, but you, so you, I, I think I heard about Gregor Mendel, like, in junior high or something, so you're probably familiar with him in general. He did these famous uh, experiments with pea plants. Um, before him, a lot of people thought they didn't understand heredity. They thought things just kind of blended, um, which and and to their credit, like sometimes sometimes when you're just looking at something visually, you're like it kind of does look blended, but that's definitely not how gene genetics work at all. And many traits, even though they appear blended, are not, and often most many of them are not blended. They don't don't even have the appearance of being blended. Anyway. Um, slide 17, you can just see, like, just in general, some of the things he looked at when he was doing these experiments. Basically, he was, like, you know, taking plants and, like, combining them to, you know, reproduce, having them reproduce and looking at what he was getting in the end um, for just with plants, like um, the coating of the seed, the coloring, 
the pod shape, the pod color, the flower color, the flower position, like all, and you see the, the visuals of this, like what was going on, what was he looking at? And then he started realizing, hmm, there is kind of like a process to this um, in terms of like what the male has or the female, what the offspring have. Sometimes things, traits seem to kind of skip or like he realizes that there's a whole process behind this, um, which is why he is often um, referred to as like the father of genetics or whatever. Um, slide 18, Mendel's conclusions. Um, hereditary, hereditary characteristics are controlled by units that exist in pairs and individuals. So he started realizing there are things called genes and alleles, like these packages of information. Pa somehow a package of information is being passed down. There are pairs. We're seeing them. Um, <sighs> And then he started, uh, per the second point, we started, he started to understand, and of course, and then we start to understand this process, this factor of dominant versus recessive. I hope, for, I'm, ass, I'm only kind of going a little fast on this because I'm assuming most of you are probably familiar with this, at least in a very general sense. Hopefully, if you're not, you're still following me. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that you guys can just replay it. Um, okay, so slide 19. Punnett squares. We're gonna have we're gonna do an exercise together too. This is gonna be fun. I think I have that on this PowerPoint. Okay. Punnett squares. Um, so so like I said, I'm sure, I'm assuming most of you've had this, but if you haven't, we're gonna do a few together um, just for fun, you know, to understand this process. So often we use letters to represent a physical characteristic. Um, I would say whatever if you're practicing along with me while we're doing this, don't make sure you always use. Um, a letter where the uppercase and lowercase look different. Don't use S. Don't use F. They look too similar. Don't use P. Like, you want it to be something that looks very different. Like, I like to use A because uppercase A and lowercase A look very different. But really, don't use C. Don't use anything where you have to, like, if, if, because you want to be able to see the difference. You don't want to have to make like a giant C and then a tiny C to be like, oh, clearly. You want to have like, well, you can just write it. Um, so like I said, I like to use the letter A because uppercase and lowercase look very different. But basically you're using uppercase to represent um, that it's a dominant trait, lowercase to represent that it's like the or allele, the recessive allele. Um, and we talked about this before because there are pairs, those pairs of alleles um, for any, on any of the paired chromosomes for any trait. Now, like I said before, this is a very simplified version and not all traits that you have are a simple like it's just on one allele that's obviously not how genetics work um but there are there are some traits that do and that's why we're kind of focusing on that for this class okay so given that idea that there are two there's a pair um hopefully this makes sense to you i haven't listed that there are only three combinations homozygous dominant so two dominant or two like if we're looking at the letters two uppercase alleles, homozygous recessive, so two lowercase, two recessive alleles, or heterozygous, one dominant and one recessive. There's only those three combinations you can have if you're looking at dominant and recessive. Two dominant, two recessive, or one dominant and one recessive together. Those are the only three states that you can have. Okay. Moving on. Oh, this is a good one. Okay. Mendelian traits. So this is when you do, Mendelian traits are when they are simple, when it's just one gene, one trait, simple process. Okay, and in class this is more fun, but while you're watching this video, do this. Don't think about it, just do it, do that. Now look at your hand, you have a thumb that's on top, right? There is a gene that codes for this behavior. Because if you do it the other way, do it complete. don't just move your thumb, move all your fingers like to where your, your other thumb is on top. It feels unnatural, right? Like now I have all my fingers adjusted and now my right hand is on, right thumb's on top and it feels very weird. I would never do that naturally. It's natural for me to go, and my left one's on top. So you have a gene that codes for that trait. Um, but I also have a list of some other ones on the PowerPoint. So earlobe attachment. So whether you have uh, attached or unattached. And I often get the question like, I don't know what that means. There's a picture you can see the earlobes. One's attached and one's unattached. You have a gene, one simple gene that codes for that trait. And you, you either have one or the other. Um, so Darwin's tubercle. So if you look at the ear, there's that little like nodule. A lot of people have this. It's just a, a thing. Uh, that little like kind of nodule in the cartilage of your ear, um, a cleft chin, 
Um, so you can see Adele. That's kind of an older picture of Adele, but she's got the nice cleft chin. Sometimes a cleft chin's a little like, you know, crack or the, not crack, but you know, like cleft, I obviously cleft it. Or sometimes it's the dimple. Um, and then I have a picture there. I don't, sorry, hold on one second. Uh, I didn't have it listed on the, on the bullet point. I must've moved it. But, um, so there's a picture of Evangeline Lilly with what's called the widow's peak. So when you have like the point of your hair, when it comes down in that little point, um, that's a Mendelian trait. Either you have it or you don't have it. Um, it's always, I think it looks really pretty when I see women who have that trait. Um, like, oh, it's so pretty, you know. Um, so that's a Mendelian trait. When we were in class, we look around you. Who has, uh, who has a cleft chin, you know, but we can't really do that here. But if you're with anyone, be like, yeah, do this. <laughs> okay. Um, ooh, okay, so now we get to have some fun with some exercises. Okay, so genotype and phenotype. So this as an example. Let's say we're looking at dominant versus recessive, and for flower color, let's just say that purple flowers are, the, I'm sorry, purple, the color is dominant, so we see that's gonna be represented with the uppercase, where well, we're gonna do a Punnett square. And white is recessive, so white is represented in the Punnett square with the lowercase a. Um, so first, so it's before we get to the Punnett square, what are the, can I read? What are the flower colors for the following genotype? So if I just gave you the genotype, you would tell me what the flower color is based on this, just this example I've given you. So we have an individual, individual who is, or the flower is, um, let's see, capital A and capital A, uppercase A, uppercase A, so that is dominant and dominant. And here we know, based on the example, that purple is dominant. And here, so basically what this is saying is you have an individual flower that has one gene, one allele that says dominant and another allele that says dominant. So they have one allele saying purple and another allele saying purple. What color is that flower going to be? Purple. That one's easy, right? Same thing um, for the one on the bottom. Um, lowercase a, lowercase a. I just blanked for a second. Um, so white and white, if one allele is saying white, the other allele is saying white, what color is it gonna be? It's gonna be white. Now go to the one in the middle, heterozygous. So they have one allele saying purple, one allele saying white. What is the phenotype? What is the visual thing you, I'm saying this like I'm a flower. What is the color of the flower gonna be? It's gonna be purple. So when we're looking at things like dominant versus recessive, dominant is going to kind of hide or mask that recessive allele. So genetically, there's still that gen gene in that individual flower, or if it's, if it's a person we're talking about a trait, that, that gene is still there, which is why they might not visually have it, but they might pass it on to their kids or something, or maybe you see it like in their grandkids. But vis visually, what you will see phenotypically is just that dominant trait. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys, okay. Oh, ooh, we're gonna do one together, okay. Let me get my, yeah. We're gonna do something. My boyfriend bought me these really cute, like double-sided. <laughs> he was like, I oh, hope this isn't a dumb gift. I was like, I love it. Okay, so, okay, so we're gonna do one together. A Punnett square. Okay, the widow's peak hairline is a dominant trait. He's talking widow's peak, you can see the picture of Allison Hannigan, is that right? Oh man, I might have to put a new example. Do you guys even know who that is? I, I'm, I'm assuming you guys, some of you don't, okay. Um, so she has the nice widow's peak. It's that, you know, point in the hairline. You can see that in the picture. Okay. Um, but okay. So here we have an example of imaginary people. So the widow's peak hairline is a dominant trait. Okay. And we have two individuals, Mark and Anna. Mark is homozygous. I'll just write this down so we can see. So we see Mark is homozygous dominant. So I'm going to use the letter A. So I'll just write this down. Homozygous dominant. So we can say Mark is homozygous dominant, right? And then the problem is also telling us Anna is heterozygous. Anna is heterozygous. So re remember that means one dominant, one recessive. So before we've even done the Punnett square, we know like this is basically what it's telling us. Now, like I said, you can use any letter that you want as long as the uppercase and lowercase look different, just so it doesn't conf you don't confuse yourself or something. Okay, so now it's gonna ask us another question. If they have offspring, and it asks three things about that. So we wanna know, okay, what's gonna happen if they have offspring? So that's when we're gonna draw the Punnett square. So we're gonna make our square look like this. 
throw a square, I'm gonna make four sections to it. And you're gonna put Anna and Mark on different sides. So let's say I'll put Mark here, and I'll give him the double, okay, Anna. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense to you. I put Mark on the top and Anna on the side. Mark is homozygous dominant, two ways. Anna is heterozygous, um, capital, um, I said two ways, obviously, you guys. <laughs> two uppercase and then Anna is uppercase and lowercase. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna pull them down and over. So let's see if I can do this, like uppercase, 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 lowercase, uppercase, lowercase. Hopefully that makes sense to you how I fill that in. And then we can answer the questions in on the screen. What percentage will be heterozygous? So what person it's asking what percentage will be uppercase, lowercase? So we're looking, okay, there are two, two out of four, right? 50%. Okay, that one's easy. What percentage will be homozygous recessive? So it's asking about this. What percentage will be that? None, right? Zero percent on that one. That one's easy. What percentage percentage will show that trait? Show that trait of being of having the widow's peak. Now remember, there are three states: homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous. Um, for the dominant trait, homozygous um, dominant will show the trait because it's 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 like widow's peak, widow's peak, right? Heterozygous will also show that trait. Widow speak, no widow speak, but that dominant one's going to mask the allele. Now, if there are any individuals who are homozygous recessive, it's saying no widow speak, no widow speak. Then they won't have it, obviously. So it's asking what percentage will show that trait of widow speak? Yes, 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 hundred percent. Hopefully, this is very simple. Hopefully, this makes sense to you. Let's see if I can pull it up. Hopefully, that makes sense to you, right? Okay. Let's see. And I think we have one more. Ooh, yes, we have one more example. Next one, we'll do one with hair color. So here we have straight hair versus curly hair. So straight hair, and per the example, straight hair is recessive, curly hair is dominant, and then we have Clara and Steve. So it's telling us Clara is homozygous recessive. So I'm still using A's. So we got Clara, homozygous recessive, Steve is heterozygous, so one dominant, one recessive. And so it says if they have offspring, so let's draw a Punnett square for them. So just like before, make your square, four sections, and then you can put your individuals. So here we have that. And then you can fill that in. You can ask this question sometimes. Does it matter which one you put first, like the bigger or the little? Like, no, it doesn't really matter. But I just, but whenever I do, whenever I see it, it's always the big one first. And I think just visually, it looks weird when you put it the other way. But it it doesn't matter because you would still be able to tell. You're like, oh, that's heterozygous if there's one of either. It doesn't matter what order they're in. Okay. Now we have that, now we can answer the questions. What percentage will have straight hair? So remember, straight hair is recessive. So for this, remember there are three states. Any, there's only three combinations, right? For this one, straight hair versus curly hair, those who are homozygous dominant, that's basically saying curly hair, curly hair, right? So curly. This one's saying curly hair, straight hair. So curly hair is going to mask the straight hair, right, gene. And this one is saying straight hair, straight hair. There's nothing to mask it or hide it, no dominant trait to overwhelm it. So we've got straight hair in that one. So you can go back to the questions. What percentage will have straight hair? So straight hair, for this example at least, only those who are homozygous recessive will have straight hair. So how many? We've got two, two out of four, so 50%. And then what percentage will have curly hair? Um, those two types would have curly hair. We have two of those, so if two out of four, we have 50%. Hopefully this makes sense to you. Okay, okay. I'm so glad I bought that little 
dry your grapes. This is super handy. Okay, slide 24, sex linked inheritance. This gets a little more complex. So when you look at the 23rd chromosome, um, or the sex chromosome, it's not as if on that chromosome, the only information it has on it is what sex you are. It often has other information too. And often these traits are sex linked because they might only occur on the Y chromosome or something, or only occur on the X chromosome. Um, so they're linked to that. So a good example, go to slide 25, is color blindness. So look at this slide. It's unfortunate we're not in class because usually I have at least one person like, I can't see it. Um, hopefully you see, or I'm assuming most of you will probably see all three numbers, but if you don't, you might be colorblind. Um, go to slide, I'll explain this further, slide 26. Um, sex, I'm sorry. Colorblindness is sex linked. Um, it occurs on the X chromosome. If you are a female, you need it to affect both of your X chromosomes for you to be colorblind. But for males, because they only have one X, if it affects just that one X, they'll be colorblind. So we tend to see it more in males. And usually, like, I would say every semester that I've taught this and I've asked this, almost every semester, one person says either they are colorblind or they know someone. And maybe except for one time, it has always been a male. So like that totally makes sense, but you can just see like maybe what you would see there Obviously there are different types of color blindness and there you can be colorblind I think because of some other condition, but this is just an example that some some traits are linked Directly to the X or the Y Okay, that only took 40 minutes. I'm surprised. I thought that would take much longer. Okay, so this was fun a little fun example with the whiteboard and um, I will see you guys on the next video